Hello, uh, thank you for inviting me to Guernsey and thanks to, to Mark for, for organising. Uh, my name's Jen, um, I work for an organisation called Nesta um, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, some research that I've done in the past on um, smaller countries and how they've used innovation to build a future. Um, so I'm going to start with um, a little bit about me and my job and why I do it, um, a little bit about Nesta um, and then some case studies and examples of countries that I've looked at that I think are interesting and try and tell you a bit of a story about them um, and then finish with why I think it matters now. So Nesta is an innovation foundation, we're based in the UK but we work globally um, and we're interested in innovation and when we say innovation we don't just mean research or science or tech, we mean new ideas and we mean that those ideas can come from anywhere um, and that they can achieve anything so it can be through the public sector, businesses and individuals themselves um, and we are interested in how we can support people to take on those new ideas um, and bring benefit both to the economy and to society in doing them. Um, my particular interest in Nesta is about innovation and economic growth, um, but really I'm interested in the benefit, so who actually is benefiting from that growth. Um, and working at Nesta allows me to look in more detail at that. Um, and in particular, I don't think that innovation is intrinsically good, but I do think that we as a society um, are able to shape that if we want to. Um, and at its best, it's going to provide the jobs that we want to do and the jobs that our children want to do and also solve some of the problems that we develop along the way, so the, the challenges that, we'll, that we, will, reach, uh, that we um, will come across. New solutions um, are a way of getting over those. Um, and I started to look at small countries in, um, across the world, um, because partly because I come from one, so um, I, uh, I was um, raised in Scotland, um, and uh, there's, uh, there's a, uh, been a huge debate there about independence um, over the last few years. Um, and then partly because I, um, I spent most of my career in the northeast of England, which is a particularly deprived part um, of, um, of the UK. It certainly has some of the most deprived um, areas within it. Um, and I was really interested in this sense of place. Um, so there's a current kind of trendy government policy, place-based policy, um, that talks about actually what, what is, um, how do you get things working in a place? Um, and I think that for me, um, as a policymaker, um, in um, the northeast of England. Um, I was interested in, in my role within it, me as a citizen of the place, and how I am um, involved in it. Um, and I think that the, the, um, the divide between policymakers and people who live there is pretty artificial. Um, and um, and I, I think that that's something that we should explore more as, as a society, actually. How do the people who um, are um, involved in making decisions interact with the people um, who are um, recipients of the decisions? It's surely it's in the best interest of everybody to get this right. Um, and so working at Nesta has allowed me to um, explore some of those, so move from a policymaker role to actually looking at the wider questions that we might want to answer. Um, so small nations, um, the first thing I'd like you to consider is when you think of a country that's good of innovation, which ones do you think of automatically? Um, so you may think of the US, um, which is some of the best universities in the world, um, some of the um, most, uh, um, uh, some of the greatest uh, and biggest businesses have come, have been start, uh, start up there, particularly in the in the tech world. It's got a, a really strong um, investment market. So there's lots of venture capital. Um, so really successful, um, particularly uh, through um, investing in tech. Um, you might also think of a country like Japan. Um, when you think of technology, a lot of our, um, particularly electronics, have come out of, out of Japan. Um, and so you, that might be one of the other ones that you might think of. Um, or you might think of a, um, a country like Germany um, with this really strong manufacturing base um, that's really embraced um, advanced manufacturing uh, uh, techniques and um, rebuilt their economy on it. Um, all these countries, at least in terms of population, are pretty big um, and they've got a large domestic market that they can sell to, um, they've got strong um, investment, um, uh, internal investment um, and they also have a, um, a huge population by which they can draw ideas from. So I wanted to look at, if you're a smaller country, where do you stand um, in the world um, on this? Um, so um, we, uh, I looked at um, uh, pop, uh, countries across the world and small countries can be just as, as innovative according to um, the measures by which we uh, look at innovation. Um, so I picked some of those. Um, I looked at countries with a population of less than 10 million and particular about how they use their size. So what is unique about them? Um, 
and how that helps them be more innovative. Um, so I'd like to talk you through a couple of those examples um, and try and tell you a bit of a story about those countries. So the first one that I looked at was Finland. Um, so Finland in the mid-90s was in a bit of trouble. So the Soviet Union had collapsed, it was the main trading partner, <coughs> um, and um, the, their main um, industries, which uh, were around wood and paper, um, had um, gone down as well. Um, but since then, they've turned their economy around, and that's mostly through investing in innovation, um, and, and in quite a unique way. So I've got a few bullet points about how they did that, but I'll talk you through. Um, so they prioritised investment in research and, um, and development. So the government, when it was cutting pretty much everything else, increased the amount it was spending on R&D um, and supporting businesses to invest in R&D. Um, and part of the reason they can do that is they took a commitment um, to go towards innovation-led growth um, and put it at the heart of government policy. Um, and um, they also uh, looked at how innovation could be used in public services. Um, and I think one of the most important things that they did was hold a national conversation. Um, so uh, in 2012, um, they undertook an exercise called Finland Foresight, where at a really local level, they asked citizens, what do you see as the future of the country? What do you think the government should do? And then built that up to a national picture. Um, and I think that that, to me, gets people invested in it. Um, gets people invested in the future of the country um, and allows everybody to move forward together. Um, the second one I looked at was Estonia. Now this is a country that is the go-to example um, for a country um, that's really heavily invested in technology. Um, so in 91, um, only half the country had a phone line um, after uh, uh, Estonia split from the Soviet Union. Um, the country then decided to invest really heavily in tech um, and um, it took a real strong cross-government commitment. In fact, the, it was a prime ministerial level commitment that this is, the, this is what uh, they were going to do. Um, and they did this um, by rolling out um, our, um, uh, early infrastructure into Wi-Fi. Um, so in 2000, um, Estonia um, enshrined in law the right to the internet. So it became a basic human right to access it. Um, and then they also tackled the education system. So they put in place a program that was specifically um, about making sure that at a very early age, children were learning to um, deal with um, uh, the technology around um, the internet, so they were particularly coding. Um, and then they used their cross-government commitment to integrate some really quite complex government projects using the size of the country to be able to do it. Um, so their online public services um, platform is called eEstonia, um, and it became the first, Estonia became the first country in 2008 where a general election was held online. Um, so you can vote via the platform, you can start a business, you can pay your taxes, you're all in the one place, um, which uh, at the time, and I think even now, is considered pretty innovative. Um, they also looked at an electric cars network. So ahead of the technology, um, they put in place the infrastructure so that electric cars could be rolled out um, across the country. And then finally, Singapore. Um, Singapore is a classic example of a country that's really embraced openness, um, and it's seen um, as having quite um, effective government policy, um, and it's regularly at the top of the, of, um, the league tables for innovation. Um, and they've done this because it, uh, by um, particularly open policies around attracting people into the country. Um, so they've focused on um, talent, in, uh, including science and researchers, so bringing knowledge into the country, um, and also foreign companies. Um, so they've set up systems by which they can quickly act if a, com um, if a company would like to invest, they can uh, turn around a package that involves support for that company to coming in, land, um, access to the workforce, if, um, and so that makes sure that company will, will be able to respond really quickly and get them before anybody else does. Um, they've also looked at clustering policy, um, where they've put research facilities and businesses together, um, particularly around sectors, um, and lots of other countries uh, have, have, are doing this as now um, as a result of the, some of the um, advances that Singapore have made. And then finally, they've looked at their tax system. Um, so when they're looking at uh, taxing companies, um, they've widened the definition of innovation so it's not just about research and development, but actually about all the things around innovation, so training their staff, 
marketing, design, product development, um, and it means that actually companies are encouraged to do more um, of um, the wider set sets of activities that allow um, innovation to flourish in a country. So I think that um, from these, um, we pulled, I pulled out some lessons that I think are relevant um, for small countries around the world. And when I say small countries, I actually think they're relevant for local areas, for any area. Um, when you think about actually uh, place-based development, um, then these are the types of things that I think are unique about the way that you develop what's happening in one place. So a lot, mo well most of these countries were in some way open to the world. So using the, the uh, uh, mitigating the fact that they had a smaller domestic market with, the fact that, uh, with an ability to be able to look across the world and see which bits do we want to borrow. So in particular people um, and um, knowledge, um, but also ideas. So what's happening in, in other countries and how could we replicate that here? How do we tweak it so that it works for us? Um, and then obviously markets and trading. The second um, lesson that I think that, uh, that these smaller countries um, could give um, is around getting the whole of government involved, using their size to get the bits of government that larger companies can't make work together to be able to do that. Um, so innovation isn't just the responsibility of the business department, but it actually involves the education department because you need to skill people up to be able to do the jobs that innovation might be creating. Probably involves the transport department as well, because you need to make sure the roads go to the businesses. Um, and the housing department, where are the people who are going to live um, that are going to do the jobs that you're creating? And a real sense of planning for the future. Um, the third area is um, around the institutions that they create. So these are public institutions using public money and they might work with businesses and they might be public-private. Um, but their ability to be able to create Agile institutions, ones that can make quick decisions, that can take risks that in a larger com uh, country can be quite hard if there's a bureaucratic system around that's developed around a, um, administering a larger country. Um, so the ability to take risks and the ability to be able to um, take more of an entrepreneurial approach, let's try something and see if it works. And that's my fourth point as well. One of the key things that um, the more innovative countries were doing were experimenting and testing new ideas. Um, so using their size to say, actually, we can do this in our country um, and we can do it faster. Um, and if it doesn't work, we'll stop and we'll do something else instead. And then the fifth area that I think is really important is about developing a sense of national mission. So using their size to have a conversation with their citizens and agreeing what is the way forward um, and who's going to do it um, and getting people lined up to be able to take that forward. Um, so I'd like to finish um, with a few reflections on why this is, is important now. So I originally did this work in 2014, which was ahead of the Scottish referendum for independence, um, which was a once-in-a-generation opportunity for, the, for Scotland. The world has uh, moved on a little now, um, and, but I still think that there's lots of um, interesting reflections for countries that are, do have a smaller population. So when larger countries are becoming uh, potentially more protectionist and thinking about actually their own development um, and politicians are talking about metaphorical and physical walls between countries, it would be really easy to think that a small country is disadvantaged by that. Um, but actually, there is an opportunity um, and there are um, characteristics that smaller places have that they can use to be able to move forward under that environment. So things like it's going to be really important um, to consider how you are open to the world, which, um, uh, which bits of the open, um, uh, which bits would you want to keep and which bits um, do actually you want to think about how uh, you take it forward. Um, and then actually what's within the small country itself and how can you promote those? So is it more about thinking um, about local businesses and how to support those and can the public sector help more with that? Um, and think about local procurement and supply chains and developing those. Um, and then finally, um, an ability to be able to talk to citizens and think of uh, people who are making decisions is not just separate from the rest of, of, um, of, this, of society, but actually they're part of it um, and that we actually, that you can uh, make it um, a way forward and do it together. Um, so I think those are the types of interesting questions. Um, and what I'd like to do for the rest of the day um, is talk to you about what you think some of this means for Guarantee. Thank you.